Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Sasquatch Odyssey. Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us tonight for the show. Super, super excited about the fantastic guest we've got coming up here in a little bit. We're going to bring Bobby on the show shortly. But as always, I want to open the show and invite you. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, please send me an email. You can get me at brian at sasquatchodyssey.net. I answer those daily. Um, just send me an email and let me know what you have going on. Please include your contact information when you send me an email so I can uh, reach out to you via phone. Our guest tonight, as I said, lives out near the Uari National Forest in North Carolina, and he has got some amazing stories to tell you guys about the activity around his property. It backs up right to the National Forest, and he has had so many, so many different encounters that he's going to share with us tonight. So I'm excited to get to him, and without further ado, let's, let's jump right into it tonight. Thanks for coming on the show tonight, Bobby. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. The um, is all mine. So I'm just going to let you uh, go ahead and I know you've had multiple encounters, so you're going to go kind of chronologically with what, what happened out there. So just walk us into the first encounter, what you were doing, um, and tell us what happened out there, man. Okay. So, um, you know, like everybody else, I've heard stories. I never gave it much thought. Uh, I've lived in the area of the URA forest for my whole life and did all the hunting, camping, fishing. I, I do all that stuff I always have. So in 2013, <clears throat> me and my wife had went camping down at Baden Lake, something that I have done for years um, and never had anything happen, but so in 2013, we were at a place called Skier's Cove on Baden Lake. And um, so there were other people camping that weekend also off to the right of us. And um, so everything was normal the first night. And it was Memorial Day weekend, by the way. Uh um, Saturday comes around, we're fishing and whatnot, so it starts getting on over in the night, and, uh, the, uh, folks that were camped down to the right of us, they were having themselves a good time, and, um, so we decided we were going to go to bed at about midnight, so about two third in the morning I get woke up to this loud scream um I sat up in the tent I was like what in the world was that I'd never heard nothing like it before and so I'm sitting there and about 10 15 seconds later it let out another scream, but it was closer to us than the first one. The second one woke my wife up. She said, you know, what is that? I said, I don't know. So I uh, had unzipped the tent door, but I was still sitting in the tent. And, um, it let out another scream, except this time it was behind us about 20, 20 30 yards at the most. Um, my wife, I'm, I'm telling her, get out of the tent. I don't know what that is. You know, I can't see nothing in here. I'm not staying in the tent. And she was so scared she wouldn't get out. So I fly out of the tent, I have my lantern hanging right on a tree, two foot in front of the tent door. I strike the lantern, and I hear the thing take off. So I didn't get to see it that, that time, but that was a first encounter. And so 
So I look around a while. I don't see or hear nothing else. I go back to sleep. We get up that morning about 6.30. And the people that were camped to the right of us, they are carrying their stuff back up the path towards the dirt road. And one of the ladies we actually knew, she's from our local area. And uh, my wife asked her, what, you know, what, what was she doing? And she said, we're leaving. Didn't y'all hear that thing last night? She said, I'm never coming back down here. So I, I told my wife, I said, I've been coming down here my whole life. I, I don't know what it was, but it ain't running me off. So uh, the rest of the weekend was pretty quiet. And when we came back home, I started looking in, trying to find something that matched the sound that the creature made. Um, and the only thing I could find that matched it was Bigfoot screams. And uh, I knew, you know, I already had an idea in the back of my mind that's what it was. But, so, about 12 o'clock that day, that next morning, after they they had left, I'm down by the lake fishing, and my wife calls me up. She says, you need to come up here. So I go up behind the tent, like I said, about 20, maybe 30 yards, and, um, where this thing was, it had through excrement. It was all over the back of our tent. It was all up in the trees, on the trees. And, and when I say up in the trees, I'm talking, you know, 10, 12 foot up in the trees. And... Those, I mean, there they were. There were big old barefooted feet prints. And um, so when I got back home, I started looking into it then, and that was in 2013. And so we, uh, we wound up about a year and a half later buying the place we live at now. And my property is surrounded by URA forest. So I had um had a big rattlesnake in the front yard and I killed it because I got babies and I didn't want rattlesnakes hanging around my front yard. So anyway, I threw it up in the edge of the woods, didn't think nothing about it. The uh, next day, I come home from work, and I thought, man, I wonder if that thing's still there. Well, and it was a great big old rattlesnake. It had 16 rattlers. So anyway, I go check, and it was gone. And I found that kind of odd that it got gone so fast. So I didn't really think nothing much more about it besides that it was just odd. So... The next week, it was on a Tuesday night, at about 2, between 2 and 2.30 in the morning, we're in the bed asleep, and my, bed, my both of my bedroom windows face about 30 yards from the wood line, okay? This something smacked my house. And it smacked my house so hard twice. The first one woke me up. The second time it hit it. Everything in my bedroom along that wall was shaking. It slapped it so hard. Bang, bang. And um, so I jump up out of the bed. I grab my fire alarm. I take off outside. Don't see nothing. The next night, 2.30 in the morning, 
the same thing. Pow! Pow! It broke my shutter in three places, about seven foot off the ground. I take off outside again. That's up. I already had my light and everything on my nightstand, so it only took me maybe five, ten seconds to get out the door. I don't see nothing. And, uh, well, that got me to thinking, what is going on around here? So the next week, my wife and I had, were going on vacation, and I have farm animals, so my brother stayed at my house to take care of my animals while I was gone. So he calls me Wednesday morning, that next Wednesday morning at like uh, 3, 3.30 in the morning. And he said, man, what is going on at your house? I said, what? He said, something slapped the side of your house so hard it shook the whole house. So, and that happened again to him, too, the next night, okay? Him and my nephew went outside. They never saw anything, but what he said, it sounded like a woman up on the mountain screaming. And so, when I got back home, I got to looking around, and that's when I found my first track. Uh, here, and that track was uh, 16 inches long. Um, it was a left foot, and it it ran right from my window through this little path by my wheelhouse, and right back up into the forest. And uh, that is when I started. I started doing research. Um, since then, let's see, I mean, it's just, it's multiple, it's ongoing activity here, um, and almost every time something happens, other people are around with me, um, but, uh, so, last February, I had already been looking in to, I had got a trail cam picture back during the last deer season two years ago. Um, and we had been up on the mountain, we found tracks and stick structures and X's and all this kind of stuff. And, um, so me and my brother, we take off out there and we're going to do a little squirrel hunting, but at the same time, we're going to look for Bigfoot evidence. So we get down in the creek bottom and we're standing there talking and this thing starts making this noise. And the best way I can describe it to y'all is it was like a deep, loud huffing noise it started across the creek from us and it kept getting louder and louder and louder like it was coming closer to us so i said let's let's ease back up this mountain i don't i don't know what that is you know we start easing back up the mountain and it followed us off to our left and it's still I don't know, that's the best way I can describe that noise, y'all. If you heard it, um, it, 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 it made you think you was fixing to have to fight for your life. But, um, well, let's go we back got to about halfway. First. Yes, sir, go ahead. I, I, I hate to interrupt you, but let's go back to the first, uh, when you guys were up at Skiers Cove and you heard the yes, scream. Sir. What? What could you, you said you came back and did some research and you found some things online that sounded very similar to that, that people were saying were Bigfoot screams. Right. What did it, what, what kind of description can you give the audience as to what that sounded like? Was it, was it, it really far away? Was it, just tell us as much detail as you can as okay. what it sounded like. 
Okay. Um, the first one I heard, that's the one that woke me up. So I woke up as it was happening, you know what I mean? Um, it was across the dirt road up on the hill is where it came from. Um, and it came down, I think the second one, it had came down and it was across the road in the woods with us. But, uh, it, it sounds, that one sounded deep like a male, you know, but it was loud and I, I, I mean like, when it did it behind our tent, you could feel it. I mean, I was like, oh, God, what in the world? Is, you know, um, it's, I don't want to say like a woman screaming because this one didn't sound like a female. It was just a guttural, loud type roar like scream is the best way I can describe it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like a line roaring, but, but more volume. I mean, it was loud. And, um, and then, like I say, it did, and that's something else that bothered me about it. It came, from across the road on top of that mountain down to where we were and and I mean in no time. And when it took off it was gone, just gone like that. But uh um the same I mean when they scream like that it's hard to describe uh A lion roaring is the best way I can describe it. It's just not quite as, not quite as just like a lion, but. Uh, I've, I've definitely good. not heard the scream. I've, I've heard the, the howls around my property here in North Carolina. Um, right. And, but I've heard people describe the sounds and I, I've, I've often heard people talk about it sounded like a woman dying in the woods. So I was just curious yeah. just if that was similar to what you guys had heard. But I've, I'd also heard that, you know, some people describe the scream as like a lion roaring, um, and it's something that you just feel in your chest when it happens. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So what, uh, and, what and else the, has happened out there? The reason I believe that first one that we encountered was a male is because uh, the day me and my brother were here, a squirrel hunt, and that thing started making that racket at us. We went up the mountain. Um, I was, I had already been doing some research, so I stopped about halfway up, and I picked up a big stick, and I banged the tree with it twice. Well, the second time I hit that tree with that stick, it broke. And it, that thing didn't like that none, and it let out one of them roars. And, and it sounded the same as, as the one at the Baden Lake did. So we get on top of the mountain and, um, my brother, there was a big blue over oak tree up there and, um, he runs and jumps up on it and he is looking down the direction that this creature is making this noise from. And I'm standing there trying to catch my breath because we just went up this mountain. And um, I look up at him and I see the look on his face. So I take off running over there and I jump up on the look. And there the thing is, and it's it's looking up there at us behind an oak tree, but its head, its right shoulder, and its arm is all out from behind the tree and uh, it's about 40 to 50 yards away from us and it's huffing at us and uh, my brother he actually saw it walk up to the tree 
I missed that. I just got to see it when it finally turned around and started back down the hill. But um, And that's when we took off to get out of the woods. But, um, I mean, the, the face on that thing, um, the skin on his face was like a dark, darkest, grayest color. And I'll never forget his eye. His eyes, his eye looked like it was as big as a quarter. And his arm looked like it was probably six foot long and big as my leg. And, um, How tall were uh, they what, what you guys saw was? It was every bit between seven and a half to eight and a half feet. Um... Well, we've been back to that spot many a times and stood at the tree, you know. And I mean, it was, um, I already knew they were here because I'd done and got pictures on my trail cams, but that was the first live encounter that I had here where we are now. And, um, it was pretty, uh, well, I mean, it was scary. I ain't gonna lie about it because, you know, it, it, that thing, yeah, I mean, he was, he was probably, I'm gonna say he was closer to eight and a half feet tall because he was standing downhill from us, way down the side of the mountain there, and he was still, you know, looking us in the eyeballs almost. Um, um, and he had dark black hair or fur, um, but there wasn't none on his face. Uh, and his head, man, the head on that joker was probably big around as the stern wheel on your vehicle. So he, he's, he, he's very big, um. So I used to, the first year we lived here, I bow hunted during deer season way down deep at the creek, and uh, I don't do that anymore. Um, I, I still hunt, but I only hunt when it's firearm season. But um, since all that, after that happened, uh, well, I mean, there's been... It's ongoing activity here. We, uh, I've had them take my an my animals. We've got chickens and stuff, and um, now they've we actually, have. They've actually come in and killed chickens. Is is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, if that's not been, but maybe. Uh, Five, six months ago, now I got, I had 20 chickens to get going in less than a week. And, um, I sat outside at night trying to figure out what was going on, you know, and never could catch anything. Um, and, uh, a fox don't have that big of an appetite. <laughs> uh, and we do have a few coyotes, but I've never found one up here in the yard yet. And they couldn't get my chicken coop. This thing was was pushing pushing my fence down from the top. Fence is about six foot tall, and it would be pushed down in the middle. And like it just would reach in there and jerk chickens up. And, and, and a duck got gone the same way too, one of our ducks. Uh, and I actually finally did get a picture of one of them behind my chicken coop. Um, but, uh, and then the most recent thing that happened right here at the house was last month, well, we actually heard whistles in the woods last night, but um, 
last month, my wife, she was sitting out on the porch, and it was about 10.30 at night, smoking, and um, she called me, she said, honey, come out here. I go out on the porch, and I thought, like, what is it? She said, there's something down there in the driveway stomping and making a ruckus. So I come back in the house and get my light and uh, my firearm, and I go down the driveway towards the direction the racket was going on like that. And I hear something take off through the woods, and I hit it with my flashlight, and it runs runs down toward the power line. So behind my hog lot, there's a power line back there. So I go down in front of my hog lot, and I'm standing there shining my light around trying to find this thing. And when I find, I find three sets of eyes. Um, and they were, you know, they were all over six foot off the ground. So we've done got this, I've done, we have gotten used to them, if that makes sense. I know people are going to think that sounds crazy, but, um, to a certain extent. Yeah, as, as used as you can be to something that's seven or eight feet tall that's taking your chickens and banging on your house well, right? <laughs> yeah well I mean the, the thing is is a lot of folks when they have these encounters they have the reaction my wife did when we had our first encounter down at Skiers Cove at Baden Lake she has yet to go camping with me anymore since that happened that happened in 2013 um, but now where we live out here, they live here. They're always here. Uh, they don't always act up and stuff, but they're always around. In, I'm not saying in my yard, but they're always in these woods right behind my house. Um, but she feels safe because this is our home. My reaction was opposite. They're not going to stop me from doing what I've done my whole life. Um, so I that definitely night get that. that. I definitely well, I mean, that. I look at it this way. When we go in, in the wilderness doing whatever, um, whether it be hunting or camping or fishing or, you know, hiking, you can run across a bear. There are some a few black bear around here. There ain't many, but there's a few. Um, and North Carolina wildlife will tell you there's not, but we do still have mountain lions running these woods. Um, I know there's one that comes passes through here every once in a while, but that you know, and and we got rattlesnakes and you. My point is you can you could run into anything that's dangerous at any time when you're doing this kind of stuff. Uh, I think people should, you know, I'm not saying don't be scared because now they scare me still sometimes. But uh, I don't think we should uh, give in to them so easy when they show themselves, you know, when they're being aggressive is what I'm saying. Uh, I got you. I got you. I just wanted because, to go back to, go ahead, go ahead. Well, for instance, that night when this happened here last month, I started hollering up. And I told them, stop messing with my animals and quit coming up here scaring us. And I, and, and I told them, I'm going to start shooting at you if you don't stop. And uh, something that a lot of folks may not know about these things, um, they talk. And I don't mean they just make racket. They talk to each other. They've got, they have a language amongst themselves. 
Tai mūna āsā var dēļ ēl, bet dījum, mūna dījum, man būtu something back. Mā vāf, she had come around to the side porch, and she said, you need to get in the house. And I was like, did you hear that? She said, yeah, I heard it. You better get in this house. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not scared of them no more. They're not running, they're not running me off and they're not going to keep taking my own. What, what did the, and, what did the, what did the mumbling sound like? Could, could you hear it enough it, to make out what it sounded yeah, like? Yeah, we've actually, I mean, I've, I've heard them do it several times. I've got, you know, my wife's heard them do it. I got buddies that's been out here and heard it. It, it's, I mean, to me, what it sounds like to me is a is like an ancient foreign language. That's what it sounds like to me. Some people describe it as gibberish or samurai chat, or they call it. But uh, to me, it sounds like an ancient language. You know. Um, I don't know what they said to me. I'm pretty sure I got an idea, but I can't. I'm not. You know, I'm not going to repeat that on here. But I'm pretty, <laughs> pretty sure they told me to forget you. You know. Uh, I got but, you. Uh, have, have you heard yeah. the Sierra sounds? Have you heard the samurai chatter? Yes, I have. Okay. So, but, yeah, but, but is it similar to that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, same word to that. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it's, know, it's kind of like, you know, that's kind of what it sounds like. I got you. I wanted to go back uh, for a second, um, if yes, we could, sir. about the, before I forget this, the, you mentioned you had several photos that you had gotten on your trail cams. What, what? Yes. What kind of photos have you got of them? Um, I'm, I'm curious about that because I know a lot of people say that that's one of the things they've done to keep them off their property is to put up trail okay. cameras, and, and it's very difficult for them to catch pictures of it. So I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that you were able to get some photos. Are they clear photos or just tell us a little bit about those if you would. I have a few that I think, uh, I mean... Are they crystal clear like I'm standing in front of a camera? No. Can you specifically tell what you're looking at? Yes. Uh, um, the first one I ever got, I wasn't even trying to get a picture of them, okay? Um, the camera was up for my deer hunting purpose. And, uh, so what happened is I'm checking my camera, looking, you know, for different bucks and stuff. And my buddy happened to be at the house that day. And this was in September of 2019 when I got this first uh, trail cam picture. I mean, of 2018, I'm sorry. September the 14th of 2018. So, um, I'm sitting there on my computer looking through my pictures, and my buddy's like, what is that? And I'm like, what? You know, I blow the picture up, and they're about 10 or 15 yards behind this buck deer is this figure standing there about, I don't know, that, that, that one appears to be about 8 foot tall, too. Um... And I mean, you, you can tell what it is plain as day. You know, nobody has to say, oh, it's over here, you know what I mean? And, um, so that was the first picture I've got. I'm going to say this about people saying that trail cameras run them off or keep them off your property. They don't. They don't hear anyway. Um, now, they will figure out where they are, uh, and you will stop getting pictures of them. The reason I have the pictures I have because I got lucky and figured that out, and I, 
I probably shouldn't be telling this, but I guess I'll tell it because I want people to know about them. Um, I move my cameras often, and that's how I've got the pictures that I have. Um, I found that if you leave a camera in the same spot, if you do get lucky and get the first picture, you won't get no more uh, from that camera. So I move mine often. Um, I just got two pictures last week, and uh, them the last two trail cam pictures I got. Uh, I'd love to but, see the uh, pictures, man. If if you have them and you're you're willing to send them to me, I I wish you would email them to me because I'd love to take a look I, at I, them. And I will. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I have a I have a handprint cast, and I have five or six footprint casts so far. Um, and we actually. There was another guy coming over here, here, back in the summer doing research with me. And um, he actually caught one walking across my power line behind my house on his FLIR thermal imager. And uh, that video, all the pictures and the videos, Brian, are on my, on my Facebook page. Okay, I'll but definitely I'll send, go and I'll, I'll definitely send them check them out. I'll send them to you anyway, but they're all on there. Yeah, um, that'd be great. I'd love to. I'd love to throw them up under the uh, the episode once the the episode's up. So, right, um, man. You know, I, I I struggled with this researching thing for a while, but the re- here's why I got into it because, um. It's something that bugs me about the Bigfoot world is uh, a lot of good people have encounters with these things. They don't know what, what it was. They don't fully understand what happened. And when they they go to some of these, I guess, researchers, um, and they tend to get laughed at or you know, and such. Um, that's why I started doing research myself because I had reached out to people before and it's like, you know, nobody was interested. And I was like, well, I mean, man, people need to know about these things. I know people do know, but I think people should be able, and I, I like what you're doing because People need to be able to tell their stories without someone mocking them or making fun of them or telling them, oh, that didn't happen, Sasquatch don't do that. We don't know what all they do. You know, um, I know exactly. they throw that's, rocks that's, at that's, you. That's, yeah, and that's, that's, that's one of the reasons that I started the, the podcast and the show was because that very reason. I wanted to have a safe space for people who've had these encounters to come on and share because some of the things that you've already shared so far tonight, I've heard 10 times that, Oh, that doesn't happen or you can't get those pictures that way or that it's just a different experience and it's a different part of the country. It's a different set of possibly a family group that you've got living on or near your property. And those are kinds of experiences that, Hey, you know, there may be, 200 people listening to this that say, hey, I've had the exact same thing happen to me. I'm not the only one. So uh, I, I applaud you and anybody else who whoever comes on the show that's willing and, frankly, brave enough to just tell their story as it is. No nonsense. Right. Just put it out there. So I think it helps people. I think it's important. You know, I was in one of the groups recently on Facebook, and one of the there was a guy in there that was talking about his experience, and he's traumatized by it. He's actually um, coming on the show tomorrow um, to talk about it. Um, and he was in the group, you know, like, what What do you do after you've encountered something like this? How, how do you deal with it? 
and you know, I reached out to him and I said, Hey man, I think the first thing that, that you have to do is talk about it in a safe space with somebody who's not going to criticize you, who's, who's not going to think you're crazy and just let you tell your story. Uh, and I think that's a, a very important part of these types of experiences is just being able to tell your story. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. It's, uh, uh, it kind of gets under my skin when I see these researchers poking fun at people because they say, you know, Sasquatch don't behave that way or, or, or that's never happened before or they don't do that. Um, at this point in time, there are no experts on these things. No one has lived with them yet to know exactly, you know, all their behaviors. And so yeah, my question, uh, my question uh, to anybody who calls themselves a researcher is, where are you keeping the Bigfoot that you are studying every day, and when are you going to put out your paper on all the things that you've been able to study with this Bigfoot that you have somewhere stuck away that you're researching? Because it's... Right. In the end, if if you don't have one of these things in a place where you can actually research it, all you're right. doing when you're going out and doing what you're doing is you're investigating. There's a big yes. difference in research and investigation, and those, those folks that call right. themselves, quote, researchers, they don't know any more than you or I, that's for sure. Yeah, I'll tell you. My page does have to talk the word research on it, but... I come at this thing from a whole different way because, you, like you said, you know, the guy was asking me how do you deal with it. The way I dealt with it was to approach it head on. Um, and I talk about it, and if people think I'm crazy, so what? Uh, I got uh, I got proof. Um, and I didn't ask for it. It just happened to me, and... When something happens to me, I'm one of them people that has to know why, what, when, and where. And but um, the activity around here, it's it's. Uh, let's see. <sighs> they, I mean, after, after that deal down at the hog lot, they slacked off messing around the house some, but. Um, I've got multiple recordings of howls and screams, and it's just an ongoing thing here. Uh, they they tend to move further uh, back in the forest this time of year, and that's just because there ain't as much cover because all the leaves are gone. But um, yeah, I wanted to go back, Bobby, if we could, too. You mentioned the banging on the house. Yes. <laughs> I, I've heard that so many times. There's there's so many stories of, of people having these encounters where they're out, they're in a camper trailer somewhere, or they're, yeah. they're in their house, and these things come up, bang on the side of the house, and then you go out five seconds later and there's nothing there. What, what I know th this is... Completely a guess, obviously, because nobody really knows. But what what do you think that behavior is? Do you think they're trying to be playful? Do you think they're trying to antagonize you? What What's your take on that that kind of behavior? In my in in our particular case, I believe what had happened is I had been feeding them, but did not realize it at the time and uh, that's what got the rattlesnake um, and that's when you know after the rattlesnake is when that started like the next like, three four days later when that started they did that uh, two nights in a row the next week and and the next week so they did it four times all together, and every time it happened, it was at the same time, too, around 2.30 in the morning. Uh, I think they were doing it because 
they want more food. And it's a, it is an aggressive behavior, uh, just like any other creature. If it, you know, if bears tearing the dumpsters and stuff and trash cans, once they realize, hey man, this is easy food right here, and then it stops, sometimes they get aggressive. Uh, yeah, I've heard I've heard that before. That that it's almost like a an unknown or uh, it's not something they were doing on purpose, but it was kind of an habituation situation where there's a food source that's there, it's there, it's there, and then it's not there. And then it's almost like they get pissed off and they're they're saying, "Hey, where, where's my food?" That's exactly right. Um, I can tell you this about it. After all that went on and. By me talking to some other people, it dawned on me, man, you, you know, you've been feeding them and you didn't even realize it. Cause I had noticed things would get gone. Uh, like, and not like, you know, a, a coon came up and eat it. It would just disappear. Uh, and so what made me realize this was, I'm a deer hunter, so when I would get done with a deer, I would take what's left out in the woods. And uh, three years ago, I noticed that the carcasses were disappearing. Not not a coyote didn't come and eat, you know, along it where it was at, or drag it five or ten yards. They would be completely gone the whole thing and uh, that takes me back to the first picture I got because the other guy that was coming out here with with me this past summer doing research um, we set up on the mountain and we were staying up there at night time man I mean we had there was four of us up there the first night. We had wood knocks coming from both sides of us all night long. That night all together we wound up getting nine loud, crystal clear wood knocks done to us. Um we recorded howls and stuff out there while we were doing that. They throw rocks at us, sticks. Um, but the deer thing, the reason I brought that up is we had done and been going out there during the day and at night for about three weeks. <clears throat> well, we went back this one particular day and they had erected a great big egg formation right behind our tarp about 20 yards and it was not there well that same day we found a deer skull laying up there about 10 yards from the tarp that was not there well in that picture that I got that thing was right behind the buck deer and um There's a lot that people don't know, and I'm fortunate, and I feel very lucky to live where I live, but uh, I noticed after I got that first picture that where I would bait the deer at, I started seeing rocks laying that weren't there before, and I believe that they, and I'm not talking about pebbles neither, I'm talking about rock, big rocks. I think that they were sitting up there and when these would come in the feed, they would bust them in the head with them rocks and then jump on them and finish them off. Um, but anyway, so when I noticed that they were taking my deer carcasses, right? Last year, they took three. This year, they took three. Um, so I got the idea to put 
the carcasses in the woods and put a trail camera on them. And um, I got lucky this last time and got one picture. Uh, and then the carcasses are gone. I got that pit or there, excuse me. I got that picture and then the carcasses disappeared. They're gone. Um, wow, that's and, crazy. You know, there, yeah, there, wasn't, there ain't any drag marks. And I'm talk, when I say the carcass, I'm talking about when we get a deer, we take the hands, the shoulders, and the back strap off of it. Everything else is still there. The head, the neck, you know, the ribs, stomach, the hide, it's all still there. It's all still attached. Um, but never have I found a drag mark where a bear or something like that got it and drug it all. Um, so we found that deer skull up there on the hill that day. And um, I said, man, you know what they're saying? They're saying, give us some more deer, please. Why else would they have brought that over here? Um, so, but, yeah, no, I mean, we, we, we put up, <laughs> they will be aggressive. That's something else. Uh, they, they are not teddy bears. That they're really not. Um, I can't yeah, speak for anybody out. else's. Go ahead. I can't speak for anybody else's experience. In my experience, um, we had that one charge us up the mountain. That's the only time that ever happened. But I mean. They they are aggressive. They growl at you, and, and they'll break trees off, and they'll throw rocks at you. And and it's be, it's not because they are trying to really hurt you. They want you. They don't want you in their area. They don't care if you stay around the borders, but they don't want you in their area. Um, and they're just trying yeah, to think- get you to leave. I think you're spot on with that for sure. A um, couple of quick questions before we wrap it up. I wanted to go back to the when you had came out and saw the. You said you saw the. I think it was three sets of eyes that you saw. Was yes, it eye shine from the flashlight that you were seeing, or were they glowing? Because I've I've heard accounts of people saying that they saw glowing red eyes. Oh, um, okay. That particular night, it was from. Me shining my flashlight. Um, I have seen the red glowing eyes. Um, I actually have trail cam pics of that, two of them. Um, but that particular night, yeah, I was shining my light, and bam, when it hit them, uh, there they were, and and. And there are, I'm, there are at least four around here because three of them are a dark blackish color and one of them is red, reddish brown. And they all got different size feet. So that's how I know that. Um, uh, I, I mean, but yeah, I've seen the red, red eyes and I, I believe that that particular one may be the reddish brown one, and he ain't pleasant. Every time he ever comes around, he causes trouble, uh, or he he acts aggressive. But um, but yeah, them. I, I mean, the one set was probably seven foot high. The other set was maybe six six and a half foot high. And then the other set was maybe my height, which is, I'm 5'8". And there's a male, a female, and a younger one. And I believe that, that, that was them that night. But, uh, 
it's it's crazy, man. I I used to uh, be a one of them people that was like, man, them people's nuts. Ain't no such thing, ain't you know? But uh, it's easy to say that it, until you run into them, right? <laughs> they are definitely real. I don't have to do another thing. I don't need no other evidence. I don't need something else. Something else. They are here. Um, I have to know, ask you this question. Um, I've I've heard numerous accounts from from all over the the place, all over the world, really, but. It right. seems to be a common theme with people who have these things on their property that are that are there right. constantly and interacting with you the way that it sounds like these things are. And I know that people think this is probably a little, um, I don't know what the word is, like woo-woo, I guess, but have you seen anything else strange around the property? Have you seen light? or some of the orbs that other people have talked about when, when they've had these things on their property and had these kind of encounters on a regular basis? Have you seen anything else besides like a eight and a half foot Sasquatch okay. running around? I have saw an orb before. Um, I just, I personally don't know if they're related or not. Uh, but when I saw the orb, my brother and my best friend was with me. We all three saw it. And it wasn't, it was, it was a, uh, it was kind of a bluish color. But it was just a little round, like ball of light floating through the woods. How uh, big would you say it was? Uh, Maybe about the size of a softball in somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and it is interesting because my best friend, he, he, he thought that I had lost my marbles. And that's the reason we were out there that night. And he actually got to hear the samurai chatter, as they call it. Um, and see footprints and things for himself. So, uh, but, uh, and then, I don't know if I still got that picture or not, but I did have a picture, a trail cam picture of a beam of bright white light come down. I mean, if you can tell it was coming down from the sky, it wasn't no flashlight or nothing. And it was there, and then it was gone. That picture was in the same spot I got the first picture of one of these uh, Sasquatch at in September of 2018. Man, that, is, it, that fascinates me because I, it's, it's very rare that you hear, like I said, uh, an encounter where these things are around and on the property constantly that something along the lines of an orb or some sort of weird light, and I, I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I think it's fascinating, and I, I just, I wish I had an answer, but I just, I don't know. I don't know if it's a weird coincidence or if there's some sort of correlation between the two. But almost without fail, I always hear, yeah, I've, I've seen the lights or I've seen the orbs, and very similar to what you've described. So it, yeah. it, it just. It baffles me, but I, it's almost without fail the same experience from everybody. Yeah, um, I've seen the orbs uh, two times, but now that being my light, that's the only time that ever happened. Or it's the only time, I wouldn't have saw it had my trail cam not caught it, you know. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see but, the picture. If you can find it, I'd love to see that as well. That'd be That'd be cool to see. But now, I will tell you this. Three weeks ago, we were doing a night investigation, and I had my, uh, I set my vision video recorder up, and I caught a clear white orb on that. 
it comes from the top of the screen, it comes down, and and it's gone. And um, you can, I mean, you can you can blow it up, and you can see right through it. You know, it it, it kind of amazed me because I, I I was like, what is this? And uh, but in six years now, like I say, then. Them three incidences with lights, that, that's all that's happened. Uh, but the, uh, the Bigfoots or Sasquatch, they, they tend to be here. Their activity near the house is more in the spring, summer, and fall. Uh, it slacks off right around my property in the winter. And, uh, and then it, it'll, uh, it'll pick back up, but we, they're always here, um, and it's, the best thing I can say about it is, they're real, I mean, um, I've, uh, we've learned to live with it here, we do, we keep an extra eye on our kids and stuff, but, uh, yeah, man, that's the only thing. I, I agree with you. I, I think that's probably going to be the name of your episode is They Are Not Teddy Bears. Uh, these people well, think they're fuzzy, you know, forced friends to go out and play with are, are, are sadly mistaken. Um, and I think it's a very good idea to keep an eye on your kids and, and your animals and keep them closer than you normally would when those things are around because they're 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 clearly... I believe there's some sort of an animal, um, some sort of an ape, and um, they can be very unpredictable, man. I've heard a lot of stories of people that didn't have great encounters. They were they were pretty aggressive, and, and I believe these things have killed people. So, Oh, yeah. Um, that, yeah, they have. We, we had an encounter back in the summer. Uh, the other guy that was, that was searching me out here to um, he stayed up there, in a, and my wife wasn't feeling well that night, so I came back home about midnight, and at around 2 in the morning, and we, we were messing with them on purpose. I'm not going to tell you on here what we did, because I don't want to give that secret away, because it works. But uh, that's how he caught the one on his for thermal video recorder. Um, but uh, I had to go up there and get him. It came up to the tent. It was banging the ground, stomping its feet, and it came up to his tent, and it, it, he thought he, it was going to jerk him out of the tent. Um, and he has been doing research for a lot longer than me. He said, man, I've never been that scared by these things. And, uh, you know, I said, I told you, man, they ain't, they don't always do that. They did it because of how, what we were doing to mess with them. But at the same time, uh, I was at work one day, wife called me, we got a pool out here beside the house where my youngins was in the pool. And she called me and she said, there's something huge out here in these woods stomping around, breaking tree limbs and stuff. And I, and I told her, I said, describe to me what it sounded like. She said it sounded like a 700-pound man tearing through the woods. And I said, well, if you can get the kids out of the pool and go on back in the house. Um, and everything I'm telling you, there's always been multiple people with with me. It's not, I, matter of fact, I have very few encounters by myself because um, uh, I've pretty much always got somebody with me in the research I've done. And I, I, here's something a lot of folks don't realize and they need to know it. These things have been being documented all the way back into the 1600s. Um, Leif Erickson wrote about them. He came over here, and I, I believe it was 1721. Um, 
you know, if Theodore Roosevelt wrote about them, the Indians have been talking about them for centuries. So it's not a new thing. It's just something that uh, modern-day man don't want to accept for some reason. So, That's absolutely uh, right, man. They, they're definitely, they've been around. They they are here. And um, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on it. I would love, like I said, if you can, if you could send me everything you have as far as pictures and, and the audio, anything you want to send me, that'd be great. I'll throw it up under the, the episode and let people hear it and, and experience some of the things that, that you guys have experienced there, man. And I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and, and telling your story and, and sharing and just fascinating stuff, man. I really, really appreciate it. Yes, sir. I, I appreciate you having me on. Um, I'm glad to get to tell folks about this stuff. Uh, and I will definitely send you the pictures and stuff that I have. Uh, that's why I do it. I think it's because people to know, hey, man, if you're going to go out in the wilderness and do whatever, you might possibly run into one of these things. And the more people that know that, when it does happen to them, it won't be so such a shock. Uh, exactly. They've got it, exactly. Got it in the back of their mind. So, um, but yeah, well, awesome, I really man. appreciate it. Oh, the pleasure was all mine. I, I, I'm fascinated by your encounters, man. And like I said, you let me know if anything else happens out there, and maybe we'll have you back for a part two for sure. Uh, yes, sir. Sounds good to me. That's going to do it for tonight. Remember, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, just send me an email, brian at sasquatchodyssey.net. 